Hey everybody, welcome back. And today we've got another fun project. Today I've got a Pioneer HPM 60. And I know I've already done an upgrade on the Pioneer HPM 100s. Somebody brought us in a Model 60 and an HPM 150, the biggest model. So that one's coming up next. But first, wanted to take on this one. And before we really get into it, let's talk about this a little bit. Let's talk about vintage speakers because we've had quite a few vintage speakers sent in and some are considered classics. A JBL that I just did, the Pioneer HPM 100s, the, the Yamahas. Why are people sending us these classic vintage speakers? A lot of these speakers, especially some of the Pioneers, have a lot of nostalgia built around them. I mean, these speakers were kind of landmark speakers in their day. These were the speakers that you could find in your local stores. These were the popular speaker. And it's the speaker that, for a lot of people, it's the speakers that their dad had. It's the speakers that they had in their dorm room when they were a kid. It's, it's a remembrance of something that was a lot of fun and brought them a lot of musical enjoyment back in the day. These were the ones you could crank up you could just jam on the latest whatever. And it wasn't so much about being an audiophile. It wasn't about creating a three-dimensional sound stage and placement of instruments within. It, it wasn't really about that at that time period. It was, it was more about the music and less about the gear. And the, the rage behind higher-end gear was kind of in its infancy then. It was... It was a new thing that was just getting going, and these were at the forefront of that period. This was a fun speaker. So when you when you go back and you look at these older models, and you think, absolutely, there's a nostalgic connection, but how do they perform compared to a modern speaker? And there's only one clear answer to that is they don't really compare to a modern speaker. We've learned so much since the mid-70s and early 80s. Things have come a long way, a long way. I tell people often it's kind of like remembering those old muscle cars from the 60s. That was a great era for cars. But how do those cars compare to a modern car? They really don't. You know, back when I was a kid, if you made it 100,000 miles on a car, it was time to overhaul the engine. And today's cars will go 100,000 miles before you even need to change the spark plugs. It's not even a comparison. Speakers are a lot the same way. The technology has come a long way, and the improvements have come a long way. We're doing things now with speakers that the old classics weren't even capable of. And a lot of that has to do with the tools that we have. We can measure and test and see things and understand things that they didn't even realize was an issue back at that time. So there's there's a gap there. Yeah, sure, you're not going to just go back to the old HPM 60 and think, man, this is, this is the speaker. It's not the speaker, but it is a cool speaker. And people send us these classic vintage speakers because they want to go through these things and bring them up to a more modern level. They want to enjoy them. They want to listen to them, but they also want to enjoy the music. And let's face it, there's there's a big gap there from where they are stocked to where we can take them. And it's not a subjective thing. We're not ruining, ruining a classic speaker. Um, it's not a matter of which do you like better. It's, no, we're... We're making huge levels of improvement because technology's come a long way and we're fixing issues and there's going to be some issues with this one that are actual issues. There's, it's not a question of, you know, does it sound better? Does it not sound better? Does, does it sound better when the cabinet's buzzing or when it's not buzzing? Or does it sound better when the drivers are ringing or if they're not ringing? It's like, not a question. We're going to fix some specific issues, and then we're going to bring the parts quality up by a lot. So let's get into it. Let's take a look at the HPM 60. And this one that the customer brought into us, 
looks like a brand new speaker. I mean, it looks mint. This thing is in perfect condition. There's not a mark on this thing. It looks like it's been stored for the last however, 40 years or however long it's been. Now, looking at the crossover. I mean, this is the, one of the reasons I say we can make this sound better. And it's not a question of will it or will it not. It's significantly better. The old parts that they used in this thing were just what they could get at that time. And these were designed for price points even back then. These are really budget level parts. All these little iron core inductors here even have, not only are they an iron core, but they've got steel screws going through them. And there's little electrolytic capacitors. And then they put these big pots on here so you could adjust the mid-range and the tweeter to make it sound however you wanted. And these are the worst things you can have in the signal path. I mean, these old things, especially when they get dirty, they're going to degrade the signal quite a bit. So there's a lot of improvement there. And these connectors, they're just spring-loaded, stick the bare wire into connectors. And obviously, you take bare copper wire and you stick it into a hole that's stripped. That copper is going to oxidize, and it's going to oxidize up to copper. And same with all the wiring that we cut off of this thing. This had... 18 gauge or less, you know, wire on it. This is a little thin wire that is completely oxidized by this time. It, it, it'll oxidize right through the PVC. You strip some of it off and it, it doesn't look like a new penny. It looks green. So there's a long way that these speakers can go. And we're going to try and take it there. And then we're going to try to make it so that if you own a pair of these, you can upgrade them with what we're going to hand you. We're going to hand you a a bunch of new crossover parts. We're going to hand you some new wiring, new connectors for the back, some no res that you can line this thing with. And we're going to make improvements in all areas. And we're going to make this to where not only is it a fun speaker to listen to, but a, a great speaker to listen to. And it's got some good bones. There's some good things there to work with and there's some challenges to work with. So let's dive in and take a look at it. Let's look at the measurements. Let's look at how it measured and why and then let's see what we can do with it. All right, let's start off looking at the on-axis frequency response. And when I took an on-axis response, I mean, I used this as a reference point, center of the cabinet here at the tweeter level. And I adjusted these pots on here to make the smoothest response I could possibly make at that axis. And I got a pretty good result. Let's take a look at it. Pretty smooth all the way across, a little bumpy at the top end there. It's a little bit of a dipped area at around 6 or 7 kHz and a little peak at the top. Overall, though, pretty smooth. You'd think, hey, these are pretty accurate. Well, accurate in one sense. Let's look at a spectral decay, though. This is where things really start showing up. Um, if we look at this, we see that there's a lot, of, a lot of ringing going on, a lot of stored energy there where the driver's are simply not releasing the note. The driver's it's, it's excited, and the outer edges of the cones are still vibrating and moving even after the signal has stopped. So it causes this long decay of ringing. It's, it's a distortion. It's artificial. It's not part of the input signal. It's not a good thing. And in this case, there's, there's not a huge problem, but there's a lot of areas there where we've got excessive ringing. Um, there's also some issues from diffraction off of the drivers that are not countersunk. And there's a pretty good um, amount of baffle around this thing. So there's some baffle reflections going on as well. Um, before we move on, let's look at the impedance curve. You'll notice this thing's tuned to 32 hertz. Uh, that's with the port here that's on the front. It drops to a minimum of 4.1 ohms. Um, but it's a pretty even impedance load all the way across, mostly because the drivers are kind of playing on top of each other. And this crossover is not really acting so much like a crossover as it is just keeping drivers in a range to where they don't self-destruct. So it's protecting the mid and the tweeters so that they don't play up so high or up, down so low. Sorry. Now, let's look at... Some of the issues that this thing has because the way it's made. If, if you stack drivers like this in diagonal configurations, as you move, let's say, this direction, you're changing the time arrival between the tweeter and the mid pretty significantly. And if they're overlapping onto each other, suddenly where they overlap, 
they're out of phase with each other. And the same goes for going the opposite direction, especially if these are crossing at higher, higher frequencies where the wavelengths are short. You don't have to move very far for them to start canceling each other out. Same goes for the vertical off axis. Just, uh, ver vertical off axis. Sound like Ron. I almost couldn't say axis. Um, he's he's going he's gonna to be mad at me for saying that probably. Um, as you move up and down vertically, the time arrival is changing again, and it's causing a dipped area in the response. So those are physical limitations that are hard to overcome, but there are ways we can help that a little bit in some cases. So let's take a look at the horizontal off axis. Let's throw two of them up here. Because it's an asymmetrical design, we measure the off axis in both directions. So off axis going one way and off axis going the other. And it's not too bad in one direction, but it's a little worse in the other. So because it's asymmetrical, it's not the same response in either direction. And as you can see, there's a pretty big, pretty big change in the frequency response as you start to move off of this center. In fact, if you move in any direction off of this point, it starts varying quite a bit. Also, let's look at the vertical off axis. There's a vertical off axis that we normally take going up. And usually it's the up that's the most important. That's if you stand up or you sit down, how it changes. It also tells you what your ceiling reflections are going to look like and what the overall in-room response is going to look like. Because when the off-axis is all out of whack, your total in-room response, taking into account all the room reflections, could be really out of whack too. So it's an uneven response, even if you're setting on this axis versus if it had the same response in all directions where it's a more even room response. So in this case, there's a lot of cancellation going on as you move up. And then as you move down, let's throw that one up there too and look at it. Uh, it changes a little bit as you go down. Uh, if you look at the red to orange to yellow line, you can see as we move down, there's some, there's some drivers that are now becoming more in phase, which makes them louder as you move down to that point versus in the vertical as we move up. They're out of phase and there's there's a big hole in the response there. So we got a challenge here. We got some issues to work with. So my next th thing for me to do is look at the individual driver responses. So let's throw this up there this way. Let's look at the frequency response of the woofer and the spectral decay of the woofer right under it. That gives you a good idea of what we're, what we're working with. If you just look at the frequency response of the woofer up to about 2K, it looks okay. Then after that, it looks real bad. There, there's some of that ringing and that stored energy that you don't want to hear. So the woofer's range is going to be limited to, you know, below 1500 hertz because we're going to have to get it out of that range above. If we look at the mid-range, let's look at the frequency response of it and the spectral decay. You can see there's a couple of little peaks there. There's a big peak there, oh, around 1200 or 1300 hertz i guess around 1200 hertz there's a peak and we see some stored energy there and then up top there's some there's quite a few bigger peaks there and you see a lot of stored energy there as well um, there's some ringing so there's a limited range that we can get that mid to work in and that's i realize it's going to be the most challenging the tweeters response not too bad there's a big peak there in one spot um and there is in the in the spectral decay, you can see a little bit of trailing going on there, but not bad. That's not a bad situation there with the tweeter. And I remember when we worked with the HPM 100s, got the same result. Tweeter had a pretty good usable range. It's a cone tweeter. It's got some movement to it. It's not like a little dome that has a, a very limited x -max. This thing will actually play down fairly low, so that helps a lot. And then, of course, the little super tweeter is very down in output. It's compared to the output of the other drivers, and, and that's the way these things were. Um, it's covering just the very top of the top octave, and as you look at the spectral decay there, you'll see it's very clean. Some of that stuff down low is just artifacts that are happening down low because we're having to drop way down in the response. So we're just picking up some noise going on there down low. It's not even really playing down that low. That may have just been room noise or something that was picking up at the same time. Um, so the drivers were definitely a challenge. Uh, it took a while to kind of work with this and figure out how to keep these drivers within a range that they could be used. I did again what's called a filler driver concept where I'm basically crossing the woofer to the tweeter 
and we're using the mid in between there as a filler and that's what worked best this mid was pretty rough in both directions so we had a limited window there that we could use this thing to where it wasn't going to be a problem so let's look at what i did with this thing let's throw up the new crossover response and you can see the slopes on there and how i actually match the slopes and made a pretty smooth frequency response this is smooth as or as smooth as any modern speaker so if you're on this axis right here it's it's a great response so i was able to do that with it and let's look at um a couple of other things what i'm, I'm still not happy with the horizontal off axis but there's nothing i can really do about it as you move left and right uh, it is what it is i crossed the tweeter down as low as i could it actually crossed to the mid at 2k hertz that helped a lot. So if you look at the horizontal off axis in one direction, it looks great. It all drops off evenly and that was moving towards the mid. So if the mid is on the outside, that means it's moving, you're moving this direction. It had an even drop off in all directions. So ideally I would probably place this in the room to where this would be on the left side, but I don't think these things were mirrored. So you're going to get what you get whether you place this on the left or the right it's you're going to have some dispersion issues because of the offsetting of the drivers the way they did if we look at the horizontal off axis going towards the tweeter uh, up top looks good but right at the crossover point down there to the mid as you go about 30 and 40 degrees off axis there's a hole there it's a little bit out of phase as you go that direction now vertical we were able to improve it a lot uh, if you look at the vertical off axis going up, you can see now that it, it changes very little. So as you stand up or sit down, it's going to maintain that response over a wide range. So that's going to help improve things quite a bit. Same thing with going down, hardly changed at all. So because of the way I designed the new crossover, we helped it in that regard by a lot. Um, also, let's look at, the. Uh, I've got a measurement here, just the on axis response by itself looks good. And then let's look at the new spectral decay and if we look at that you'll notice how much cleaner that spectral decay is i mean it's just they're dropping off and i'm not getting any of the ringing that we had before i'm keeping the drivers in a range to where they're not playing into the ranges where they were ringing and i've got a notch filter i think there on the tweeters response that is controlling some of the ringing that was there at that one peak so overall it came out really smooth um, let's also let's pull up the Spectral decay uh, that we had originally on the on the speaker and the new spectral decay. And let's look at those. And I want to talk about that for a second. Um, a lot of times when I look at something on a spectral decay, um, there will be a big peak somewhere in the response. In this case, there was a big peak at the very top. And what that does is, is it pushes everything else down about 5 dB, dB or so because it puts the peak at the top of the chart and then everything comes down from that top of the chart and it shows it 25 db from wherever the wherever the top is and what i'll often do is i'll bring it up 5 db so it pushes those up a little bit so we we miss the peak because what i'm looking at is how far do those things go um because i'm seeing ringing but i want to know does it does it continue to ring out there pretty far so in the case of the original one i pushed it up a little bit to take a look at it and i and that's just how i happened to save it on the latest one, I didn't do that. So the chart is slightly different. I mean, it's still a 25 dB range, but on the new one, I, I didn't save it that way. I didn't save it with it pushed up 5 dB. So when we look at the two spectral decays, and we can look at them one, F, one next to the other, obviously the new one is a lot cleaner, and I looked at it a lot further. I pushed it way up in the chart so that I could see how far does it go, you know, how many beyond 25 dB range, look at 30 and 40 dB, and did I have anything going on out there? And I didn't. It looked really clean. But when I saved it, I didn't save it the same way. And sometimes I just don't realize it. I've had people get upset with me saying, I didn't save the, the scaling the same or the frequency response. There's a 5 dB difference on the chart um, from the way it was saved. Like I'm trying to mislead or something. I'm not trying to mislead. If you look at the original, when this came in and we measured it, I took that measurement on the 5th of March. And then when we got to this thing and actually did the upgrade on it, uh, that day was the 2nd of April. So there was almost a month between when we first looked at the measurements and then when I worked with it new. So 
I don't remember when I'm when I'm saving this stuff. You know, what was the scale that I had it on a month ago? I don't or, or three weeks ago. I don't. You know, some things just don't get saved the exact same way, and I want to address that. This one didn't get saved the exact same way, but I'm not trying to um, mislead in any way. The new Spectral Decay is very clean versus the old one. There's a lot of ringing. And audibly, that, that's a big deal. If you can take a lot of ringing out of it so that you just hear the music only, it's going to sound a lot better. Um, let's look also the last thing at the impedance curve. It still maintained a pretty even uh, impedance curve all the way across. No big swings anywhere. Dropped to 4.6 ohms, so it's slightly easier load than it was. Um, overall, though, you should be able to drive these things with whatever amp you're using, um, just like you were in the beginning. The load is going to be the same. And we're going to go from this to a lot higher quality parts, much higher quality. And we've already put something on the website on this thing. You can see it right now where you can go and you can take a look at the cost of the upgrade and everything. Um, big improvement in parts quality, as, as I mentioned already. New wiring. You're going to get a set of tube connectors to replace these little spring-loaded push-on things. And there's going to be some sheets of no-res that come with the upgrade. And the sheets of no-res go a long, long way in making big improvements in these things, especially if you combine that with, some, with some, a light amount of bracing. If you took a few little dowel rods, cut them at 45 degree angles and maybe glued those in from the side to the back or from the top to the side or something and just stiffened it up a little. This box, ooh, man, it's a hollow box. There's no bracing in this thing. And there's certain sine waves that you can hit this thing with that this box will light up like crazy. It will buzz, and a lot of that buzzing is just noise that's not in the music. So if you put a few little braces in there, don't take up a lot of airspace, just a few little dowel rods to stiffen it up, and then line this thing with no-res. The no-res will damp out that ringing so that the bass is clean, it's tight, vocals sound richer and fuller and less buzzy, and you don't hear a whoo on every bass note. And, man, when you're used to listening to speakers that, you know, full open baffle, they, don't, they have no box, they have no box noise, no box resonance, and it's just clean. And then you listen to a box speaker that's lightly constructed. Oh my goodness. You can't help but hear that on every bass note. There's a just buzz on everything. It becomes really distracting. And these old vintage speakers, they have it badly. And back then we thought it was just part of the bass. You just didn't realize that wasn't part of the music. It was added coloration. So that no res is a big deal in these vintage speakers. It's going to help a lot. And it's going to, it's going to allow you to hear what's really in the music versus a bunch of added noise. So another cool vintage upgrade. These things, I, I like them. I like the vintage stuff. And this really transformed the speaker into something you can really listen to and enjoy. This is a significant improvement in a lot of areas. It's going to sound a lot better, especially just the parts swap alone to high quality parts. Wow. Um, that's it for this one. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know it's a little bit of a long one because it's technical. If you stuck with me through this whole thing, I appreciate it. And I've got more coming. I've got more vintage stuff coming. So hang in there. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please do. We'll see you guys in the next video.